welcome to the Sandian Lecture in the Humanities. It is my great joy to welcome you to hear Dr. Breezy Taggart give her lecture titled Reclaiming Mental Health Representations Through Contemporary Art. Welcome. I'm Scott Hinkle. I'm the director of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. Uh, I have a couple of quick notes before we get to the show. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> Sandine Lecture is named after Derek, Dr. Eric Sandine, sitting right there and on his floor. He's the founding director and now director emeritus of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. In addition to all of his roles at UW, which are too long for me to mention now, he has also been deeply involved with the State Humanities Council over the years for four decades as board member, as grant reviewer, as grant recipient, as participants. So we are all very grateful uh, to have Eric here. Uh, thank you for giving us the lecture in the name. The Sandian Lecture takes place annually on the Monday of finals week during the fall semester. Uh, every year, the Humanities Research Institute uh, accepts about a dozen faculty members, a couple of you here, thank you for coming, into the Humanities Research Group program uh, in which they workshop their projects in progress. And at the end of the year, the fellows vote to decide who among them will give the following year's lecture. So to give the lecture is not only an indication of excellent humanities research, but that the lecturer has the respect of their peers. Uh, a couple of technical notes, uh, uh, Dr. Carter will give her lecture, uh, uh, and then we will have ample time for Q&A afterwards. Uh, hello to the friends out there on Zoom land. I know there are a couple of you. Please just go ahead and type your questions or comments into the chat. And once Dr. Carter is done with her lecture, uh, she will get to those as well as questions, of course, from the audience. Uh, uh, please join us after the lecture uh, for the Cooper House, which if you don't know it, it's the beautiful building right over there on the corner of Grand and 15th for a reception. We'll have food, we'll have booze too. So please come join us uh, after that. If you want to keep in touch with the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, please just send us an email to humanities at uwyo.edu or visit us on the web, humanities. Okay. Uh, uh, you can see the recordings of our past events on our YouTube channel. Dr. Taggart's lecture will appear on our YouTube channel probably in the next couple of days. Deep, deep thanks to Sam Stowe. And Justin Young, who are uh, the University Project Committee. Uh, they do all the things for us without them, we wouldn't be able to do basically anything. So thank you to you both. Um, the Sandian Lecture in the Humanities is co sponsored by our dear friends at the Wyoming Humanities Council. And now I'm delighted to invite Sean Reese up, who has a gift for Dr. Tiger. Thank you, Scott. My name is Sean Reese. I'm the director of Wyoming Humanities. Uh, I appreciate the, the partnership we've had in being able to be a sponsor of this very esteemed lecture. Very happy to be in person. I think the last two have been online. Uh, I have gone and watched past lectures on YouTube and Breezy are among um, some, some greatness. So congratulations. We're very honored to be part of this because of our affiliation with, with Dr. Sandine. As Scott mentioned, he's been very instrumental in the success of my organization. In honor of him and in uh, recognition of your lecture, we'd like to present a gift to you that you're welcome to stash under your Christmas tree or open at your leisure, but it, it's a big deal and we're happy to be part of it and congratulations. Uh, and now, how do you want to welcome Dr. Ken Drummond, who will introduce our chair. Uh, before I begin this introduction, I do want to give a special shout out to Dr. Eric Sandine for having the vision way back when. A lot of us in this room were in this room to try and envision what wire would look like what we would be. Some of us were drovers. Some of us went around the country doing field trips to figure out models. Well, now we're a model. So thank you, Eric, for that. I want to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
And also for Professor Scott Hankel for keeping that vision alive uh, and making it the, the wonderful uh, and sustainable reality that it is. And that's not easy work. And so many of us in the room are, are helping you do that. So uh, it's a great thing that we have. So to the introduction. Those of us who have been at UW for a while often look at our younger colleagues and say, wow, she's truly amazing. Or gee, I'm so glad she decided to come here and I hope she stays. And in fact, I find myself saying that about all my younger colleagues these days. Such is the caliber of the new faculty we've been hiring lately. Have you noticed? It was just, I just ran into Neil Theobald today on campus and he said the very same thing. But as you administrators know, we're hiring the right talent, but that by itself isn't enough. Our younger colleagues need to be given the right opportunities, the proper resources. <clears throat> and when that happens, the sky is the limit. Now, such is the case with our Sandine lecturer today, Dr. Breezy Tagger. Her star is in the ascendancy, and it's a thrill to watch it. She began her academic career at Brigham Young University, where she obtained both a bachelor's and master's degree in art history and uh, curatorial studies. A series of lecturing positions followed. And then she undertook and completed a PhD in design, environment, and the arts. <clears throat> and her focus was on representations of mental illness, health, disabilities, and medicine in art, photography, and film. This is consistent with her lecture today. Dr. Taggart arrived at UW just a few years ago. And that's when things really began to take off. She was adjunct faculty in the Honors College, as well as the Department of Visual Arts and Literary Arts. Then she became an assistant lecturer in Honors and then an assistant instructional professor. Along the way, she taught impactful courses such as Freshman Colloquium, a history of women artists, and environment and sustainability issues in art. She was also a marketing specialist and website designer for the Honors College. She was indeed a Wire Fellow. <clears throat> and now, in case you haven't heard, Dr. Taggart has just been named the Assistant Dean in the Honors College. A position. <laughs> I was in that position in January. Now, I can only imagine the kind of dynamic duo she and Dean Peter Perlin will make, one that may even rival the one we've just seen with Dean Perlin and Associate Dean Lee Selton. Without question, Dr. Taggart is having a moment. She is exquisitely and deservedly coming into her own. Yet for anyone who knows Breezy, you know that her accomplishments are not ego-driven. Rather, she works as hard as she does in order to help others. And that's what makes this moment especially sweet. It really is about you, Breezy, today. So please join me in welcoming the 2022 Sandine Lecturer, Dr. Breezy Tiger. Well, as you're doing that, I yeah. So, ahead. so uh, thank you to the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, to Scott Hinkle, to Eric Sandy, and especially to the uh, last year's cohorts of fellows that voted me in. Um, I feel particularly honored to be here. And thank you, Ken, for that lovely and very generous introduction. Um, I really am honored to be here to share with you about art that I find endlessly fascinating as well as uh, thought provoking. Uh, and part of my philosophy as a human is that art is meant to be shared between others. So at various points, I will ask you to add your voice to the mix. Uh, and um, I hope you'll indulge me uh, because it is one of my most prized exchanges to have with another human being to hear what they think about art that I think is really cool. Um, so at various points, I'll, I'll ask you to chime in and, and, and I hope you'll, you'll add your voice. Um, but first, I'll set the stage. Um, so I study the intersection of art and medicine. Um, and medicine and art, uh, sometimes I forget that not everyone believes this, but medicine and art have always been intertwined. 
Um, and they have been anciently and it extends into the 21st century. Um, and so I believe that if we're going to tackle health issues today, we do have to understand representations of mental illness in the past, understand how that informs uh, maybe our understanding of representation, uh, of that representation, and then our understanding of that illness through that representation, right? It's an entangled relationship. And we don't always know that it's happened. Um, and so as we think about uh, representing mental illness, becomes particularly interesting. And I'll tell you why. Uh, if we make mental illness visible through representation, what kinds of connotations, what kinds of, of, of ideas emerge? It might seem paradoxical that we even attempt it, right? That you might make something, a condition that is often thought not to be present, maybe physically uh, on the body. How do you represent that? Is it even possible? Um, to do so. Uh, and so despite that though, mental illness has been represented visually, historically. Uh, and so I believe that we, if we understand these visual representations, uh, we might understand illness differently, mental illness differently, right? Uh, so uh, as we dive into this together, uh, I am going to look to a couple of different examples from history so that we might better understand a couple of contemporary examples, how these are layered, how they comment on each other so that we understand the contemporary examples better through seeing that layered relationship throughout history. Um, we're gonna look at a couple of examples that um, are problematic, are uh, controversial, are uh, wholly uh, inhumane. And I don't do that to reinforce these stereotypes. Instead, I, we must look to the past to see where we go in the future. Um, I'll also refer to a couple of different historical terms in the context in which they were used. So I will perhaps use insane, madness, lunatic, among a couple of different others. Um, and I don't mean to suggest that we should use them today to refer to mental illness. I use them in the context in which they were, they were used. Uh, and I, see, I think it's important to do so to understand um, how history has these implications for today. Um, so when we look at the history of mental illness throughout art, we're gonna see a number of stereotypes emerge, uh, replete with stigma, with shame, with misunderstanding. Uh, and these patterns emerge. Once again, there's no way that we can tackle something together where this is representative of all mental illness. In fact, across time, space, and cultures, mental illness is represented very differently. But in my survey of um, this historical tradition, I've come up with a couple of different case studies that we're going to look to together, um, visual iconography of mental illness that we can actually engage in you know, a 30-minute lecture uh, together today. Uh, so it comes with a caveat that, of course, this, is, this can't be representative of all uh, ways in which we've, we've understood mental illness, but they are repeated patterns and tropes. Um, and for me, visual repetition is powerful. Um, it has power that extends from those that are represented in the past, they have tentacles that extend into the future. So we're going to look to a couple of different examples together um, that will hopefully illustrate some of these um, ways in which it will inform contemporary artists working today and even inform our own perception of what mental illness is and how it's represented visually. So, mental illness has appeared anciently. Uh, we have um, in a Hippocratic treatise uh, called The Nature of Man from the 5th century BCE, uh, we see uh, the theory of the four humors. Uh, and these are fluids in the body uh, that's depicted in the 16th, 16th century uh, engraving um, that we see here, here depicted, but it occurs anciently. Uh, this understanding of the body, according to these four humors, it was thought that any imbalance of these humors would result in illness as well as mental illness. Um, 
And so here in the 16th century depiction of the four humors, we're seeing it mapped across the body, right? So early on, we're getting this understanding of, of health and illness, right? And in that mix, what it means to be mentally healthy is to have equilibrium among these four humors. Um, and so you can imagine that we have a depiction like this under the umbrella of this theory, right? That we're gonna see a number of different symptoms emerge, right? Um, that start to be categorized, right? Um, and so there's a number of different disorders that appear historically again and again and again, and they're no longer in clinical use, many of them, um, but they do start to be connected, right? Grouped into categories according to symptoms. And some of the most popular visual depictions of disorders include mania and melancholia. Uh, and so uh, melancholia appears uh, in the Western tradition of medicine uh, anciently and it extends all the way to the 20th century, uh, as well as mania. Uh, melancholia, obviously, a lot of you can assume what that might refer to, but we might see symptoms of depression. We might see symptoms of listlessness. We actually also might see hallucinations categorized into this um, disorder. Uh, and mania uh, has some similar symptoms as well as uh, increased states of fury, uh, as well as lack of control um, and of obsessive states. So melancholia and mania, um, and they appear somewhat differently across the centuries, uh, you can imagine, given the time frame, uh, but they do appear again and again, and we're gonna look to a key example right here. And I apologize, it's not the most, it's, it's kind of explained, uh, but this is all I have of this image. Um, this image uh, is a depiction of mania and melancholia, and it appears at the Bethlehem Memorial Hospital in London. Um, and this is a key site that we're going to look to actually again and again in this talk together. Um, that we have these two figures that would have adorned the gate of the hospital. Um, this hospital was started uh, in the 13th century uh, and eventually be became infamously known as Bedlam. Um, so Bedlam carries those connotations of oh, an insane asylum chaos, um, lack of care, lack of treatment, right? Um, it took on all of these connotations. It was basically a space designated for those on the outskirts of society, right? And we'll get into more of that in a second. But you can imagine these two figures adorn the gate. So this is a, a, an engraving of uh, the sculptures that would have been there. They're no longer there. Um, and this is now a, a modern psychiatric facility. Um, but it has this long history, right? So let's look at these figures, if you don't mind. Take a second. What strikes you most? Or how would you characterize them? What kind of words come to your mind? I don't mean this just like rhetorically. I actually want to hear what you think. What characteristics do you kind of see? Words that you might associate with either figure? I was originally going to say um, mania looks to me pretty open and the way the shoulders are held pretty aggressive, like ready to. Did I even tell you that was mania? No. You knew it was mania. You were yes. erect, Peter. Okay, so open, right? In, a, in an almost aggressive way. Uh, and there's a couple of different clues to that. Peter noted a couple of different visual clues. Anything else that you, you start to see in these figures? They're humans, but they've been stripped of, like, they're not wearing clothes, they don't have hair, and they're kind of, like, stripped of some of their distinctive qualities. So they've been, these figures have been reduced to the barest amount of humanity that we can think of. They're not wearing clothes, with, which we associate with some sort of civilized society, right? And that comes with a whole host of connotations, right? Um, we don't have hair. They're hairless. And in some ways genderless in some ways. Um, other reactions, what, do you, what, uh, what else do you notice about these figures? Peter immediately noticed that that was mania. What other way, if you compare them, how do you know which one is melancholia and when, which one is mania? What kind of visual clues do you get? Um, I'm seeing the figure on the right, mania, it has chains attached to its wrists, mm -hmm. whereas the one associated with melancholia doesn't seem to be restrained. 
Okay, so you're noticing the chains that is associated with mania. And this is so important uh, because if we look at Northern Italia, right, we get a state of listlessness even in this very pixelized, pix pixelated version of this image, you still can get that sense, right? That this figure has a lack of emotion and this one is full of it, of, of some kind of fury, right? And the chains help visually say, this figure demands restraint, right? Restraint is key here. And so you can imagine for patients walking into bedlam, right? Um, that is a hospital renowned, infamously, uh, for what you're going to experience there. This acted as a caution to all of those who entered of what you're gonna find beyond those doors. And it should be quite ominous. Uh, in fact, it would have acted as a caution, not just to the patients who come into those gates, but those who consider themselves outside, right? Um, for a number of different reasons, right? They're on the gates for a reason, right? Um, one, to suggest more constraint, and two, uh, it acts as a marker to society, those on the outside, right? Uh, and this hospital is particularly known uh, for practice that was popularized in the 17th and 18th centuries, where members of the upper class and aristocracy would come on a Sunday afternoon and walk through the halls of Bedlam for entertainment for voyeuristic spectacle, right? So another caution to those who are walking through that door of what you will find here, right? We get another cautionary tale uh, from a, uh, well-known English artist named William Hogarth. Uh, he depicts, uh, he's often known uh, for a satirical depiction of upper-class English society. Uh, and so that's important as we dive into this particular work. Uh, he depicts in a series of eight paintings, I'm gonna show you two of them, uh, a story called The Rake's Progress. And you might know what a rake is because of Bridgerton, but um, we can get into what the rake is, right? Um, in this series of paintings, we come to understand through Hogarth's depiction, caution to all of those who want to act in any way immoral, because it will lead to madness. Uh, and this is according to Hogarth. This is where madness comes from. Okay, so we start in the rake's progress here. Um, Okay, this is our rake. Uh, he has just inherited a ton of money from a father who just died. Uh, and we can see over here, he's getting fitted for new finery, right? Uh, and then on the left here, we see his pregnant fiance, Sarah, who is in a state, right? She's pregnant. Uh, we know this because her mother is pointing to her womb, holding an engagement ring, and is upset and outraged that Tom is breaking off the engagement. So here sets the stage of Tom rejecting his own moral obligations and duty. Uh, and through this series of paintings, we see this downward spiral of sexual promiscuity and immorality that leads to once again. So this is the same hospital that I just told you about. This is uh, Bethlehem Royal Hospital. And we get it depicted here. Okay, so here we have, can anybody tell where Tom is? Who's Tom? Would you like to guess? Yeah. I think that he's reclining in the foreground without hair, probably because he's syphilitic. He's got syphilis right here. Absolutely. So this is Tom. He's on the floor of Bedlam. He's chained in the same way that our mania figure was chained. He has no hair in the same way, right? These are images that are playing off of each other, right? Uh, and so we're getting a number of different tropes that we won't go into that reflect this is the insane asylum. This, these are mentally ill individuals. They are all here together. Um, and these are tropes that repeat again and again. One of them is obviously our, our rake here. Uh, and through his own immorality, right? We get this didactic message that says, do your duty and you won't end up here equating mental illness with social conventions and duty, right? At least according to William Hogarth. 
We also get, can anybody tell what these women are doing? There's those members of the upper class. They're just fun on a Sunday afternoon, right? So we get this sense of othering practices, right? One, through the constraints, right? We have the representation of the manacles. We have the confined space of the institution itself. Uh, and we also have that, that sense of um, individually mental illness in opposition to society, right? Because these women are representing society for us. So we have a couple of different ways in which we're seeing this othering practice occur. Uh, and it's through that space of the mental illness, or sorry, the, the mental asylum, right? It's through that space that we start to um, understand those, those, those visual markers, right? Okay. So in those four examples that I've showed you so far, those are examples of a specific institution, Bethlehem Royal Hospital. Um, and if you imagine the ways in which um, constraint, right, uh, and um, imprisonment even uh, becomes a marker for mental illness, and it occurs again and again visually, that as consumers of an image, we start to think, Asylum space equals mental illness, right? And we come to understand these individuals through the space in which they're represented. So the institution, the asylum, the clinic, whatever you want to call it, suddenly carries all this weight, um, this visual weight. Uh, and so here, I want to give you an example of another institution, right? We looked at Bethlehem Royal Hospital. We'll look at another institution together. This is by Francisco Goya, it's titled Yard with Lunatics from 1793. And take this image in, uh, and I want to ask you a very pointed question. Can we talk about just how the space is represented? How would you characterize this space? You could maybe choose a word to describe it. What would you choose? Just the space, not the figures. Yeah. Okay, so oppressive. Why? It's so dark. Okay. It's not dark. So mm -hmm. what do you think about this play between dark and light? Like what, what does it do to you as a viewer? Does it do like the fact that there's both light and dark there, does it do anything for you? It might not. It seems like the light must represent freedom, right? That they that is beyond their reach, but still visible almost to them. Okay, so you're seeing light. Here up above, right? We get this very bright white light cascading down. Yet, this is all in darkness, right? They're cast in shadow. So this, this basically tells our lives to do something, right? Suddenly, we might start at the top, right? That's the most lit space. And rather than creating a spotlight, that's everything in shadow, right? Um, Thinking about other characteristics of the space, like, what do you think? How would you describe the walls? How would you describe the floor? Is there anything to say about them? They're all, the walls of the floor are basically all like featureless uh, and everything yeah. blends together. Okay, so basically using the same color palette to do the floors, to do the, the surrounding area. It's so dark that we can't even really get a sense of the walls themselves. So this is the space of the asylum, right? Immediately by knowing the title, Yard with Lunatics, we start to put together, oh, here's like some bars, and all we see is a yard, okay? And so suddenly, we know what space this is, and the use of this light and dark is really, really interesting. So we start to see these figures that are all cast in darkness, right? Where do you fit in as the viewer? Where would you put yourself? You're up in, in the bottom of a well or something like that, and I'm, I'm, I'm trapped in the space along with them. So it's entrapment, it's confinement, it's claustrophobic, right? On one end. We might also think about, there's this space 
right? There's also kind of a void right in front of this main figure, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, there's a space between you and them, right? There's distance, and this is important visually. Uh, we see this again and again for our history. Anytime there's space between those represented and space between the viewer, we have a little bit of distance, right? We might feel the emotions of the claustrophobia, right? Because of the confinement of the space, but we have an out, right? As a viewer, we can get out. There's space between us and the violence going on here, the nightmare going on right here, right? So this is key in terms of thinking about distance between um, those who you and those who are, right? Um, and what is interesting is seeing this space depicted, right? It's, it's, it's carrying some of the connotations of bedlam, right? We're seeing chaos. We're seeing even a, a fair amount of, um, right? These figures, we can barely see their hair. We can't see their features. I mean, that mania figure, right? Yet, this is a really interesting institution. So, Francisco Goya wrote of this particular uh, image, let me quote from him. Uh, he wrote in one of his letters that Goya describes the painting, quote, a yard with lunatics in which two nude men fight with their warden, beating them. It is a scene I saw in Zaragoza. Close quote. So, this is Goya himself. But we kind of find out um, scholar uh, Peter K. Klein uh, does work on this particular. Uh, painting. And this institution is actually well known for reform. This is an institution that had, I was no longer using straitjackets. Um, that the reason they built the yard was so that the patients could go outside and not be in, in straitjackets. So it is interesting that despite the fact that this institution becomes known for reforms, right, and they, they had work to do. They had a lot more work to do. Um, just the use of not using straitjackets. Um, that Goya chose to depict this, right? Two individuals fighting their warden. But do you get that here? With the title, with the image, you don't necessarily get that these patients are, are rebelling or, or being against the warden. You just get figures that are devoid of any kind of humanity, right? And this, is, this is, uh, appears again and again. Um, so, so far, we've looked to a couple of different examples um, full of misrepresentation. Right? So we get mental illness linked to immorality. We get uh, mentally ill individuals represented as being inhuman, uh, lack of warmth, violence, of control, right? Um, and these appear throughout um, the sculpture that we looked at right at the beginning through mania and melancholia. And they appear through the confines and the constraint of the institution, which is an example of something that isn't misrepresented. We actually are getting uh, some sense of the ways in which the institution mistreated their patients. So some, a lot of misrepresentation, some accuracy, right? Um, but was it all bad? Seemed pretty grim, right? And it wasn't. There are some good things to share as well. This is, this is another example that I'll share with you. This series of portraits by Theodore Jericho, uh, and he created this series uh, depicting uh, individuals with mental illness. It is thought to have been um, for uh, the chief physician of the French uh, women's asylum, uh, La Salpetriere. Um, forgive my French, it's not great. Um, and it was for Jean Etienne uh, Georget, uh, who was believed to have commissioned these portraits. And if we look at these portraits, some of you who don't look at art that often might not think anything of them, but I will tell you they are very, very evocative for the time period. So during this time period, these would have been rejecting some really important conventions. Um, and during this particular period, romantic period into realism, this will start to be popular. Right, so when we look back at history and we go, oh, there's plenty of portraits like that, um, depicting middle-class individuals or even members of the lower class, that does appear in this time period, but this is early on and it is rejecting centuries of portraiture prior. Uh, 
So if like, we look at these images, you think about the hours and hours of work oil painting takes. Mimi Fenton knows. Uh, and we think about who would have been commissioning these portraits. Just by their representation, these individuals are being elevated. Um, because prior to this, they really wouldn't been wouldn't have been even seen as something that they should deign to represent, right? And the fact that they're represented in such a sympathetic way. And what do I mean by that? Some of you might be thinking, I don't think it's that sympathetic. This is why I think this is this is so sympathetically written. Uh, if we take a look at some of these, Jerry Cole does not depict the space of the mental institution. We actually don't get any sense of background information, and we don't get really many physical markers. Hey, maybe some of you are noticing the gaze, and we'll talk about that in a second. The only thing that unites these in terms of maybe a clue is that averted gaze, right? So let's take a look at this, this final one that I'll show you. There's five surviving ones. I'm showing you three here today. Um, and if we take a look at this image, I hope you might see, I get a sense of a brooding romantic type. I don't necessarily get kleptomaniac, right? Um, and so in these, Jericho is, is representing them in a way that is dignified. Yes, their motive. Yes, they, they demand our attention and they demand us to connect with them. But kind of connection rather than pity, right? Because they seem human. And that's of any signal of the, of the institution space. Uh, these images actually would have been created, are likely in the institution space. They would have been made in the asylum. Um, and yet those, are, those signs and markers are missing. Uh, and so this is important because um, the commissioner, uh, Georges, was partners, good friends, uh, and, and collaborators um, with Jean-Étienne Dominique Escrow, um, who is uh, well known early on in modern psychiatry. Uh, and was a supporter of physiotomy, uh, which is a belief principally discredited uh, that you could map across the face markers of mental illness. Um, and so it was believed that certain physical features were connected to various mental illnesses. And you can imagine how problematic that is, right? And if suddenly these images carry diagnostic power Suddenly, images of mental illness types of individuals depicted with mental illness suddenly very powerful to depict them and designate them as having these, these disorders. Um, and so it is so interesting, right? If we take this example of someone who is sympath sympathetically rendering uh, those with mental illness, but at the same time reinforcing beliefs that lead to misunderstanding, right? Um, so all of these images that I've showed you, they build off of each other. Uh, they uh, are not the only example of, of these types of images. Uh, and they, I believe, carry weight into, into how we understand uh, mental illness today. I, and I just want you to think of any film that you have seen that has Use the insane asylum, uh, and you can see the power of this this trope, right? Um, and so, if we think that contemporary artists, if they engage with some of this trope, how do they do it and challenge them? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of ones that I think are so interesting. Um, we're going to look to two examples. We're going to look to an uh, um, example by. Uh, an artist who is a mixed media artist. Uh, she's also um, an installation artist. Her name is Anna Schulheit Heber. Um, she does an ins uh, installation in 2003 uh, called Bloom. And then I'll also look to a project that's done in Pennsylvania. It's a community arts project called the Faces of Mental Health Recovery Project. Um, and in doing so, uh, I hope to show you that these, these stereotypes can be flipped and can be altered so that they suddenly become so powerful and 
important for how we all receive and understand mental illness. So um, you see one image on the screen right now. Click through a couple of different images from Bloom. Um, this is a uh, installation project that took place at the Massachusetts. Uh, let me get this name right. Uh, the Massachusetts Mental Health Center, um, and it occurred as a performance uh, in November of 2003. Uh, so these images are documentation of the performance itself. Um, and so in a four-day exhibit, the public was, was invited to come into this space. So this was created because this center uh, was 91 years into its operation and it was closing to make way for a new um, facility. Um, and so to mark this closing, uh, Haber was invited uh, to create this project. And uh, in it, she used 28,000 potted plants throughout the entire uh, institution uh, and filled the space so that visitors could come and walk through. Uh, and in those four days, uh, ambient noises that were recorded when it was in operation was then being played over the radio um, so that folks could wander and kind of uh, take all of these blooms in. So I'm going to give you a chance, I know it's not the same thing, um, to walk through this space. So I'll, I'll stop for a few seconds on, on each one to give you a chance to kind of take in the image. Um, I just want you to think about kinds of feelings that evoke these flowers, right? Um, for some of you, it might be very poignant. For others, maybe it's maybe it is lacking. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So let me give you a second to go through some of these images, and then we'll get into this. Think. What do any, do any kind of feelings or connotations do you start to think through? What phrases kind of go through your head? It's going to be demolished. It was already abandoned by the time that she put the installation in there. So it was in use right up until she uh, does this installation. This was to mark the transition from, we're taking this institution down and we're building a new one on its, in its place. Great question. So how is a person supposed to, um, I, mean, I get the perspective of the photographer here, but as you move through the exhibit space, how do you accommodate the fact that the hallways are full of flowers? Great question, right? Do you have to step on them or what? No, there would have been space for VR squat group. So we're getting the, the, the very full experience of a photographer who's choosing these lenses. There would have been space for you to walk through. But Haber actually talks about how I could have just used maybe a thousand blooms if I wanted to create this just with photography but she actually wanted to fill each space. Like you could get kind of a sense for these types of images um, with less blooms, but she wanted when you were there to feel like the space was immersed. So you would have space to walk. You would not have to walk on them because they are potted plants. They're not just flowers put in places. Um, but in each of these views, they're as full as they could be, right? reactions to this. What do you think of when you think of flowers? Stop. I'm trying to make my front yard look exactly like that by okay. planting as many bulbs as I possibly can. So I think it's lovely. It's very hard to grow these bulbs, Larry, but I imagine it's also quite maybe one thing I'm getting here is it's also quite difficult to keep them there. 
Yes. Why are they there in the first place? Yeah, good question. They feel arbitrary, even maybe. And I'll bet it doesn't, I bet it doesn't smell antiseptic at all. I bet it smells really good. And that would feel out of place. Where's the lights off, right? Other reactions, yeah. It's ambiguous to me though, because I flowers, I would more so think like a funeral or um, like there's like a symbol of life, but it's also, it's also making me think you know, like, like putting flowers down for funerals. So that it, it's not an easy question to answer, like, how does it make me feel? Right. Flowers have, have so many different symbolic meanings, right? In one sense, they could stand for the end of life, and in some ways, they represent healing, right? Um, and I think. Ava was actually going for this. So let me share a little bit about what she describes here. Um, and she did an interview in 2012 for Colossal and said, I was hoping to create a work that would bring aspects of play into the seriousness of the institution, an element of the absurd, right? It gets to some of these comments about they're out of place, right? It would have been infinitely easier to work with just a few hundred flowers or even a thousand. But I wanted to reach my goal of 28,000 because it had occurred to me at the beginning of the project that that was the minimum number that was missing here. If it had been a project merely for photography, we wouldn't have needed so many. But it was really a project for the passing visitor, someone coming in in real time from the street and finding the sea of color inside the building and throughout a multitude of greetings on every floor. She continued, Bloom was a reflection on the healing symbolism of flowers given to the sick when they are bedridden and confined to hospital settings. As a visiting artist, I had observed an astonishing absence of flowers in psychiatric settings. Here, patients receive few, if any, flowers during their stay. Bloom was created to address this absence in the spirit of offering and transition. So in this, these images, right, we get this sea of these are our Regina moms, right? We have Regina moms, we get some pink heathers that, that are relying on this absurdity, right? Those don't belong there. And she is trying to reinforce that they do, right? Because if she is thinking about, okay, flowers are often associated with our offering of community and support. They symbolize that often to those who are in hospital, right? Uh, She's recognizing that there's a void in that support to those who are in acute psychiatric settings, right? Um, and so filling the spaces with this very living medium has this, this very uh, layered effect in terms of transforming the institution space, right? Yeah, keep going, Bob. I, uh, I feel, uh, what I feel from looking at that is the potential of those who were there. That maybe wasn't realized. And Paul, that's so insightful because that's exactly what some of the patients said that walked through. So I'm going to share just a couple of examples. Okay. Um, one example, uh, there was a guest book as part of the exhibition that patients could um, record their feelings, also members of the public. This was not just for the patients. One guest experience at the installation was, quote, I walked through a room with a close friend of mine who spent a great deal of time inside similar hospitals. He was close to tears and repeated that he felt the desire to jump into the flowers, both for the freedom and the celebration of his own growth and healing. We recognize that Bloom brought beauty and wonder to what has always been inherently taboo subject matter as well. Here's another example of that potential, right? Um, another artist, if we take a look at this, this is the basement the hospital, and it was uh, 5,600 square feet of sod, live sod, that went into this space. And one patient wrote, specifically reacted to this treatment of the basement, quote, my therapist's office was in the basement and the floor is covered in grass. Grass does not bloom, but it cushions and it is in the right place. It is the foundation, it softens everything. Conceptually, it's brilliant. So, Looking to some of these images and, and seeing this very living medium juxtaposition against an institution that is dying, right, that is closing to make way for something new, um, really reclaims this space, right, for those patients who are particularly involved at this institution, but also from one of those uh, accounts, this was just uh, 
meaningful for a patient who just experienced that type of setting, right? Which for me links up all of these images of the institution, right? They are, they are tethered. Um, and the medium itself, the flowers, right, uh, is really important and it will continue to be so in my next example and last example. Uh, this is Faces of the Mental Health Recovery Exhibition. Uh, one occurred in Perry County in 2013 and one in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania in 2014. And what it represents is a, a community art project, basically, of uh, both functioned as a workshop where individuals who experience mental health conditions, uh, disorders, and uh, experiences came to a workshop to learn uh, practices in self-portraiture with photography. Um, and then uh, the second part of the workshop, or the second part of the project, was then to have a community exhibition um, at a key place in the community. And, and for uh, Perry County, this is at this Landis house. Uh, and so part of this was printing those, those portraits, and they were exhibited on the interior. And then posters of those uh, same images were uh, displayed on the exterior. And this happens in both cases. And then they are exhibited. We'll get some close-ups here in a second. So from this example, um, I hope you're seeing some of Jericho. Um, photography as a medium is even more associated with medicine. Since its invention in 1839, there's this long association. Because of photography's inherent connotations to truth, documentation, and credibility, even though that's entirely problematic. We know that that's not the case, yet photography continues to carry that weight in many cases, even though we understand the manipulative practices that are embedded into photography. Um, so as a medium, it's very interesting as uh, a means to represent oneself. Right? Uh, and in these images, I think they're most profoundly powerful in the self-representation, right? That these individuals are given tools and then they represent themselves. And in these, I hope that you're seeing similar characteristics. Uh, all of them exude humanity. All of them exude individuality. All of them show a kind of um, even happiness, right? That they have chosen to depict themselves in this way is powerful. Uh, and we'll see this in Montgomery County as well. Let's get to, uh, this is in Montgomery County. Um, we get a little bit of the posters being blown up in terms of the, the um, portraits, right? And I wanted to focus on one. So this is an individual, uh, Jen Blumenthal, um, and we get a sense of who she is through the bio that would have accompanied the portrait. So this is included online right now. Uh, and it's also would have been included in the exhibition itself. Text and photography working together has a long history. Um, and so we wanted to share something that she, she wrote in her own profile. Um, so we take a look at her, you know, working with the camera and then her portrait on the right. Quote, she experienced 15 to 20 hospitalizations in her lifetime during those traumatic times. She was puzzled by her life, not realizing then that she was experiencing mental illness. I believe her portrait is really intimate and raw and vulnerable and happy. And the text allows us to see the complexity of the individual. Uh, and so portrait and text working together, this was happening in Jerry Goh's portraits as well. They were becoming signifiers of disorders, right? Text working with the image. If I had just shown you the images of Jerry Goh's portraits, we would think very differently, but because they're accompanied by text, designating them, diagnosing them, diagnosing them, diagnosing them, um, suddenly carries a different kind of weight, right? So the text that she chose to include with her image carries that same kind of weight. And instead, um, we get this very, very uh, connective kind of image that allows us to see uh, mental illness in a different light than had previously been done in other images. This is a project um, actually that we see here, um, Kara Newhouse in the upper left. She's actually the curator of this, uh, this project. And she was responding uh, 
um, to, uh, she, she said she was inspired by uh, the Inside Out Project by J.R. He's a uh, French uh, well-known artist that is particularly uh, community-based often. You might know of his images of Ukraine. Um, and is very collective and community-driven, right? So she's inspired by this to create this work that is collaborative, right? One of these portraits is not as powerful if it's not linked to the others. Right? It, is, it is born out of community and collaboration, which I believe is the essence that connects these two. They're very different, right? That both rely on community, relies on um, past ideas, and are challenged and critiqued in ways that now present these, these uh, individuals, these institutions, and new lights. And I believe that if art is to have a role to play, in the ways in which we understand health, in the ways that we might meet health outcomes, mental health outcomes, artists need to be engaging with this layered history so that we can start to challenge it and create art that perhaps uh, allows for greater understanding, greater accuracy, and in the process, healing and hope. Thank you. Any questions? Um, yeah, thank you uh, for this great talk. And um, I was just wondering, you know, together with this um, iconography that you were talking about, the iconography of madness, yeah. um, there was also the development of certain social roles that went together with that. For instance, we have the category of the benign fool or we have the yes. category of the mad scientist or mad artist, uh, particularly king. gifted. Mm -hmm. yep. Or we have, of course, the category of the murderous villain. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, in a way, the, the, the maniac that we've seen, you know, the society has protected from that person. And so what I find fascinating is how seamlessly these categories are still used um, particularly in film, oh, uh, absolutely, where, you know, madness is represented. And, you know, you have all kinds of slasher and slayer movies and you have, you know, the mad scientist, and beautiful mind or mm -hmm. the future or whatever, you know, there's so many products. My question concerns, it seems to me that in the new millennium category that was introduced in the uh, filmic representation of madness, that is autism. And autism, in a way, got its center stage, uh, more or less. Um, and I would even think that um, a new category was introduced, namely the autism in the sense of the Asperger's syndrome, mm -hmm. as it was called, as the new normal, high functioning, the high functioning mentally challenged person. And um, we see this in productions like, for instance, uh, Mozart and the Whale, mm -hmm. where there's a sort of a self-empowered community of uh, people suffering from autism that really sort of create their own social environment and their own community. And uh, it's a movie of self-empowerment, if you like. If you compare that to, for instance, Rain Man of the 1980s, you know, where the artist is still the other. Okay, my question is, what is your take on this fascination, uh, this recent fascination with autism, and then also this twist to even a certain kind of normality? So there's a lot to your question. Uh, for those of you online, uh, the, the question relates to the increase in, in cinematic representation of autism. And in some ways, uh, there have been recent representations that are wonderfully sympathetic and empowering. And on the flip side, uh, you know, in those same representations, you could argue that they are carrying on some of the stereotypes and ideas that have been embedded for centuries, where we equate madness with genius. We've been doing that for centuries. Um, and in so doing, we reinforce, as long as you are good at something, then you can be um, an accepted member of society on this certain type of level. Um, and I think that appears quite a bit in film still, um, that as long as you are brilliant at something, then you're okay. 
then, then you're acceptable. You can still be in the spaces that we don't designate as we are ostracizing you from society. Um, I think that is still occurring um, quite a bit. But I also think that there are obviously wonderful representations starting to occur that pass individuals as individuals with autism, with other disorders, with other neurodivergent disorders. Um, I love that. So it's a huge spectrum, but I would argue that in many of them, there's still some of these, it's like these tentacles, right? That still emerge even when, um, even when reform is happening. And this has happened throughout the centuries that even when we see change and, and uh, better representations, we're still learning, right? We're still building off of a past that has lots of misrepresentation. So um, I know it's a complicated answer to a, a, a really, really good question that I hope there's gonna be more and more cinematic representations that present those with, with disorders as being members of society, rather than being um, often so brilliant that they're actually put on a pedestal. So maybe not, uh, not cast in a different way, but in a way that still sets them apart, right? Um, so it's a complicated question, thank you. Yes, Scott? You mentioned this phrase, if I heard it correctly, diagnostic power. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, but even thank you. I'd be curious to hear what you mean by that because you mentioned it quickly. I want to know more about it. Are there dangers to that? I can only imagine. Are there possibilities to that? What? Please talk to us about diagnostic. Yeah, and I I said it within the context of physiognomy. Um, so a belief that you can take a physical type and say they're going to have mania because they have a big forehead. Right? As soon as you give power to that, because you've seen, oh, hey, people coming through my institution, my asylum, seems like a repeated pattern. A lot of people with a big forehead have melancholia. Okay, that's a sign. Let's represent it, right? And say, this is the type. And suddenly, me, I've got a big forehead, and suddenly I have something I don't have. So the image, because it's, it's, linked to physical features uh, under the context of physiognomy uh, is very, very powerful and dangerous. Um, obviously, we have to use physical representations um, for medical practitioners to understand the body, right? They've been doing that for centuries, um, relying on artists to depict the body, in fact. Um, and how do, you, how do you get like a, a doctoral student uh, to understand the brain if we don't depict it, right? We've got to depict the body. Um, so uh, in, in many ways, we have to rely on images for diagnostic power when they're linked to physical features. Suddenly, racism, sexism, every kind of um, discriminatory practice gets embedded into those images um, that become very powerful because of their medicinal authority, their credibility under the context of physiology. Did I, hopefully I answered. Kind of? Yeah, thank you. Exactly right. That's the, oh, it seems to be, I'm way out of my field here. One has to illustrate a thing in order to show others what it is in some way. But yeah. oh my gosh, what dangers appear when one says, this is X and look what, and diagnose it there. Yeah, and yeah, we gotta continue to rely on images. And that's why I think visual art is so powerful. Go moving forward, right? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question regarding the engraving of the four humors yeah. that you began with. That appeared to be uh, the only image that was really gender. Is that typical in this sort of representation of the four humors? And is that also due to the fact of what ailments each half is representing? So, great question. Um, and typically, it's, uh, the images that I've seen is typically a, a cross um, for the, the for humorous, which um, is obviously sad to say, but makes sense given that much of uh, ancient medicine is going to center on the male body. 
Um, and you asked a second question. What was the second question? Um, just wondering if this gendering had um, something to do with the ailments that each half was representing. Oh, good question. I actually don't know. Um, uh, that like the female side is represented with this and is always represented that way. I'm trying to remember. Um, I can't say that I that I know off the top of my head, but it would be wonderful to look at um, given the placement of the female body, given the male body, um, because there's we wouldn't have had time to get into this, but there's a long feminization of mental illness that we could also get into visually. Um, and here, right, um, this is not necessarily mapping where mental illness occurs. Um, because there's types in both genders that appear historically and often, um, and it varies throughout, um, but often males are connected to mania and women are connected to melancholia. This, this shifts, there's periods where that changes, um, but, uh, and those are just two disorders. Um, and I would have to do a long deep dive into the bodily humors to find out where these started to be mapped with disorders that then start to appear. Um, and more, this is a representation of, of, of the ways in which they were thinking about the body um, and how it had to be in equilibrium in these different categories. And that could re result in illness, right? Um, what a great question. I got to look into it for my next project. Great. Other question? Yeah. Got a question for you, but before I ask the question, I have to riff a little bit sure. on the uh, Bloom ex exhibition sure, sure. because by the time I get to the question, maybe I'll know what it is. Um, when I saw the Bloom exhibition, what it reminded me of strongly, uh, maybe it's just me is going through, and it is just me, going through the ruins of Ellis Island, which lay in, in undisturbed from about 1954 uh, up, up through this period that Bloom is uh, uh, mounted in, in the early 2000s. And what it represents to me, both Bloom and Ellis Island, is the kind of ruin that comes from a kind of deinstitutionalization of various kinds of others. Um, and from that, I, I'm drawn to the portraits that were done during the heyday of Ellis Island. Oh, sure. Uh, by Augusta Sherman. Yeah. Uh, and the way that that typology of various kinds of others was replicated in the street scenes on the Lower East Side. So on the one hand, you have constrainment of others as they went through Ellis Island, and then the unconstrained and uh, kind of ominous street scenes that you would see of those same people uh, on the Lower East Side in the early 20th century. And that leads me to ask about the function of street photography uh, during depicting what's going on at the present moment when uh, mental illness is being diagnosed on the street or depicted on the street. And the, uh, the current fashion is, particularly in New York these days, to reinstitutionalize people who look as though they're mentally ill. So I'm wondering if we've come to a, a point where street photography becomes very important as a kind of vernacular diagnostic tool that's actually kind of dangerous in identifying people who in more constrained circumstances uh, might be controlled others, except if they're on your street where they could do anything. So you want to control them again. Do you, do you see that going on in, in terms of photography and diagnostic things these days or what? Well, um, photography has incredible power uh, and it continues to have incredible power despite the fact that many of us are very educated, ed educated viewers of photography. Um, 
And there's a long scholarship on uh, photography's link to criminalization. Um, and I, I do think that there's, there's, it's pretty dangerous uh, to start relying on, and this might not be what you're referring to, but anonymous street photography, right? Where a, a photographer can move through the streets of New York, right? Um, and take photographs of individuals without their consent, and then label them, categorize them according to types. That's incredibly dangerous, right? And that started, I mean, that started early on in the 20th century. Um, we have photographers like Paul Strand walking the streets, right? Often uh, hiding his camera, right? So that no one could see it through a pinhole, um, but uh, photographing um, individuals on the street, right? Uh, and there's, uh, there's an incredible power dynamic when you take a photograph of someone with their consent. There's an incredible power dynamic if you take it with it. And then add a text that is diagnostic, right? Or that is categorizing them in a certain way. Um, so I think the, the project that I showed, um, this Faces of Mental Health Recovery, I think is the most evocative because it's self-representation. Um, and so I, I do think that it's pretty, we're on a slippery slope once we start to use photography in that way um, to visually uh, categorize people, right? Um, but it certainly happens, it's happening right now. Um, it's a practice that continues and in many ways, um, celebrated at some points, you know, if we look to certain examples. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated, a really good question of like where we go from here, right? Um, and how do you uh, give photographers powers to represent when they're not representing themselves, right? Um, because I, I would never want to say photographers, stop. You can only represent things that you know, right? Uh, part of uh, the power of photography is in its documentation. Right? Um, but I do think engaging with, with this visual history allows for a more insightful and um, perhaps nuanced depiction uh, for those photographers working in that with you. I think I might have a question online. Um, I wonder if you have looked at the iconologia or examples of madness apart from the visual dialogue you have actively observed and explained. Um, um, and um, I mean, that's a great question. And I, uh, there are so many examples I could have chosen, right? Um, and uh, th that's something that I can look to even further um, to kind of nuance some of these images that we looked at together. Uh, but I do think, um, right, we just have so much that we could draw upon. Um, these ended up being the, the images that I chose, and I hope they were still engaging. Any other questions? Thank you, everyone. <laughs>